right. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties yesterday and not being able to do this live stream. Um, we're back to you this morning. And today in our uh, next round of our sequester series, I'm going to be talking about fly rods, specifically the idea of action versus application. So I've been selling fly rods for over 20 years now. And I can say that not only has rod technology in that amount of time really evolved, but so is the process in which we start talking about and selling and getting people into new fly rods. Traditionally, we'd always talk about fly rods from the standpoint of action. So, Yvonne, would you go ahead and throw that uh, graphic up for me? So, as you can see, there, you know, there's typically you got ultra fast action, fast action, moderate action, and slow action. That was how most companies, Sage, Winston, Scott, Loomis, would talk about theirs. Orvis was a little bit different. They would go with a tip flex or a mid flex, was how they spoke about their action. And generally, it just kind of spoke to how stiff a fly rod was. So a fast action rod was going to be super stiff versus a slow action rod, something like a fiberglass rod here, the Reddington butter stick, something that's quite a bit softer would be in that slow action category. Um, but it didn't really get to the, the, the true purpose of the fly rod. You know, faster action rods would be good for throwing long distance line, throwing bigger bugs, more accurate casting. Softer action rods are going to lend themselves to more delicate presentations, so better for dry fly fishing, not so good for throwing streamers, long distance, or so forth. Um, so, you know, it, it, was, it was getting people kind of towards the right fly rod, but what the, the conversation never really was pot, wasn't what it needed to be. And what I mean by that is we weren't talking about how you were going to use the fly rod. We were only talking about what the fly rod was meant to do. So we were, you know, we were only talking about 50% of the equation, that other 50% being how you're going to use the fly rod wasn't necessarily the key point of the, of, the, of the conversation during the rod buying process or just through the rod research process. So now we've moved, you know, we've evolved into this idea of well, let's talk not just about the action of the fly rod, but let's first talk about the application of the fly rod. How are you going to use that fly rod? And then how can we apply a different action, a different length, a different rod weight um, to, the, to the idea of the rod that you're going to be purchasing? So traditionally, we're talking about, you know, the ideal fly rod for, you know, fishing in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain West is going to be a nine foot five weight. The reason for that is nine feet in length and a five weight is going to give you the most versatility. You can fish rock lakes, you can fish little ponds, high mountain lakes, small rivers, bigger rivers. It's going to do a little bit of everything really well. I like to equate the nine foot five weight to kind of like the seven iron of golf where it's not going to do everything perfectly, but it's going to do everything that you need it to do. And it's going to get you out on the water for the course of a day. But as one is, you know, evolving their rod quiver, it's about, it's more a matter of thinking about how I can add a rod to my, to my collection that's going to enhance my time on the water. So if I've already got that nine foot five weight, and lately I've been really getting into throwing bigger streamers and sinking fly lines, well, now we're talking about a very different application than fishing, say, dry flies or a hopper dropper in the summer on, on the South Platte at Deckers. Or let's say you're someone that's you know, you're trying to get away from people and you've been doing a lot more high country fishing, high country lakes, little streams. Well, that's a completely different application as well. So the idea is how can we apply the application of the fly rod to the rod that you're choosing? And then we look at, so if, let's go back to the high country lake example. If I'm looking to fish high country lakes for smaller fish, obviously something like a nine foot six weight isn't going to be the rod that I'm going to be looking for. I'm going to be looking for something a lot more specific and shorter in length, lighter in rod weight. So maybe something like a seven and a half foot three or four weight would be a really ideal rod for that high country application. Similarly, if I'm looking at doing more streamer fishing, you know, that nine foot five weight probably is a little bit on the light side. So I want to look at something like a six or a seven weight. Well, if I'm someone that's going to be fishing the big articulated, really long streamers, heavy streamers, sinking fly lines, well, then I need to be thinking about a seven weight. If I'm someone who's going to be, I want a little bit more versatility out of my streamer rod and I want it to be something that I can say, go fish a hopper and drop, hopper dropper rig during the summertime. Well, then nine foot six weight is going to be more of what you're looking for. So you can start to see how we can really whittle that down better when we start thinking about how we're going to use it and not just the action of the fly rod. You know, if I want something, and, and another good example, is we've got a lot of customers asking about, let's say, an eight weight that they can use for bass, pike, warm water species, maybe some big streamer fishing here in, in, the, in the West. But they also want the rod to be able to be something that they can use down in the saltwater. Well, in that instance, you know, if it was just a saltwater rod, and let's just take Sage, for example, we'd probably be looking at the salt, sage, the, the salt HD from Sage if it was just going to be primarily a saltwater fishing fly rod. But 
now that we're talking about adding in freshwater application into this fly rod, we need to be thinking about something that's a little bit more versatile. So that Salt HD isn't going to be a good rod for fishing for bass or carp or pike here in Colorado because it's a super ultra fast action, really stiff tip. The Salt HD is made and designed to carry lots of fly line in the air, cast super long distance. Well, that's not really the application for bass, pike, or carp. So now we start looking, thinking if it's we want more, you know, we want that versatility. Now we need to be thinking maybe it's like this, uh, the Sage X. So now we're talking about a fly rod that was designed for kind of both freshwater and saltwater applications. It's going to really be ideal for that, that freshwater application. But from my personal experience, I, I love fishing the salt, the, the Sage X with all of my saltwater applications. It's going to be a really good rod for that saltwater application as well. So a really good example of how we really took the application of the fly rod and then in the choice and the, and, the end, the end result or the end decision point is going to be based more around how I'm using the fly rod, not just, well, I need a saltwater fly rod, so that's what I'm going to get. So general kind of idea, I'll open it up to some, some different uh, questions or conversation if anyone has anything. Myself. So Thomas Waldron has a question about uh, spay rods. He's asking what the best application, uh, what's the best action for spay rods. Um, I've sent him some follow-up questions, um, but if you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, spay, go ahead. So spay, so you know, now we're talking, spay rods are going to have a very singular, you know, point, right, or singular use or application. I mean, they're going to be fishing for steelhead salmon, lighter weights, you may be doing a little bit of trout spay with it. So then when you're talking about, you know, different rod weights and lengths, it's really going to be a matter of the rigs that you're throwing. So, you know, ideally for me, I like having a seven weight and an eight weight when I go spay, when I go steelhead fishing, that's going to be my seven weights going to be a little bit on the shorter side, a little bit more compact. So if I'm underneath a tree or a low overhang, I've got something that's a little bit shorter. My seven weights also going to be for my lighter rig. So I'm not going to be using, you know, T14, you know, long uh, tips of T14 with my seven weight. I'm going to save that for my eight weight. And that way I've got a rod rig for, you know, lighter weight, higher in the water column you know, shallower runs, and then I've got my eight weights ready to, to dredge deep and get into those deeper pools and find those, those fish that are, that are hunkered down on the bottom. So it's a little bit, you know, it's not, there's there's only really one application that we're ever going to use a spay rod for. You're not going to typically, you know, use a spay rod in the saltwater application, although I've, I have seen some guys using them for swinging uh, around bridges during uh, tide wind. Uh, but other than that, you don't really ever hear about anyone using a spay rod for anything other than, Salmon, steelhead, you know, and drown and and drown this fish. Uh, personal question. Uh, let's talk about uh, the front range. Uh, what's a good um, sort of action application for, let's say, front range? Uh, let's say the the South Platte uh, when it comes to fishing, like uh, deckers. Cheeseman, 11 mile, um, what do you look for in a rod? So I think, you know, fast action rods have always kind of been the bread and butter for people as of late. You know, everyone thinks that I need a fast action rod because it's going to do the most. What the, I think the, the, the misconception of fast action rods is they're really good for fishing tailwater fisheries. And I would really adamantly disagree with that just because one, tailwaters are going to necessitate really lightweight tippets. So we're going to be fishing six, seven X sometimes times fluorocarbon and if you fish really lightweight tippet with a fast action fly rod which is going to have a, you know from that diagram but not quite as flexible you're going to break off fish quite a bit more frequently than you are if you're going to be using something that's a little bit softer so when i'm fishing cheeseman i love like a nine foot five weight say trout ll from sage or the g series from scott or the h3f from orvis something that's going to have a, a softer tip to it it's going to allow for a lot more delicate presentations. It's going to allow for really the softer tips going to protect your tippet a lot better um, when you're fighting fish. So that was the other misconception that, that a bigger fish necessitate a faster action rod in order to land them. Again, not true because a faster action rod is going to have a stiffer tip. And as that big fish is pulling on that light tippet, that tip isn't going to, isn't going to bend enough to be able to keep that tippet from breaking. Versus a softer rod, that tip is going to keep bending and bending and bending allowing for better fish fighting with a, with a little bit of a softer rod. 
So I'd say for deckers in those areas where we're talking about where your fish, not, you know, sure there are some windy days, but we're not fishing really big, heavy nymph rigs. So something that's a little bit lighter weight for that South Platte deckers area is going to be a good idea. Um, you know, with this whole stay at place order, you know, we're seeing a lot of people fishing closer to home. And so we're getting a lot of questions about well, what, what's the ideal fly rod for fishing the Denver Front Range right now. So we're talking, you know, Chatfield State Park, the Denver South Platte, Sloan's Lake, all of these different, you know, Front Range, Stillwater and River fisheries. You know, most people are asking, is, is my nine foot five weight going to be a good rod for that? And the answer, unfortunately, is not really because we're talking now about, you know, we're talking bass, we're talking pike, we're talking uh, carp. So bigger fish that are we're fishing, bigger flies, heavier lines. So all of a sudden for these front range species, you know, a nine foot six weight, a nine foot seven weight, maybe like a nine foot eight weight, it's going to be a little on the overkill side. But those are going to be the ideal fly rods for those applications. Then we talk about action. So, we're, you know, we've identified the rod weight we're looking for. Now it's more a matter of, well, we're fishing bigger bugs. We're fishing for bigger fish. We're fishing bigger, heavier tippets. So all of a sudden, something that's going to be a little bit stouter is going to be what you know, a little bit stiffer is going to be the ideal way to go. Um, and there's a lot of different, there's a variety of options in those. Like the Sage Foundation comes in at $375. A great kind of starter front range rod that's going to have a great action to meet that application. Um, you know, as we look towards the, the spring season here, we're talking about, you know, salmon flies starting to move around, caddis. You know, what's the ideal application for the spring fishing? Well, we're talking bigger bugs. We're going to be using bigger tippets again, you know, heavier nymph rigs, bigger dry flies potentially once we get into June. So all of a sudden, it's going to be a little bit on the action side of things is going to be the ideal rod to kind of get you through the spring months. As we transition into the midsummer time frame, where we're talking about now caddis, PMDs, golden stones, um, you know, now we're getting into that, you know, more delicate presentation kind of situation. So we want something that's going to be a little bit on the, the, you know, the softer side. So now we're getting back into maybe like the G series or we're getting back into say like a, a, a trout LL from uh, Sage or the Orbis H3, for example. Any questions on the lines, Yvonne? Yeah, uh, Thomas follows up and asks, what's the best application for free stones as a general rule, not necessarily just spay, uh, but if you were to get a rod that you're going to be using on our uh, you know, free stones here in, out west, what would you, uh, what action or what application would you usually do? Well, so it's not just a matter of the river, Thomas, that you're fishing. The, the, the big question here is also... How do you like to fish? You know, I think there's, you know, I think most people are going to love fishing dry flies when they can fish dry flies. Some people not, not so much. But, you know, we see there's a lot of people that you're either like a nymph fisherman and a dry fly fisherman. You're kind of the streamer dry fly fisherman. So when I when I talk to people about finding the ideal rod for fishing freestone rivers in Colorado, my first question is going to be, well, where do you like fishing? What rivers are you going to be fishing? Because, you know, depending on where you live, if you're living up north in Fort Collins, well, you're primarily fishing the pooter probably. Well, if you're fishing the pooter, then like an eight and a half foot four weight is a great rod that's going to be able to, you know, get you, th you know, up and down that river year round. If you're fishing, you know, outside of Denver where it's more, you know, you're kind of the Clear Creek, Bear Creek person, well, that's going to be, again, maybe like a, an eight and a half foot four weight or maybe even like an eight foot three weight. You know, we're going to be really ideal rods for the smaller stream. If you're somebody who's fishing Deckers and Cheeseman more, well, then we're talking probably more like an eight and a half or a nine foot five weight. So first we have to identify the rivers that you're fishing. And then let's say, let's go back to, you know, the, the Deckers and Cheeseman example. So you're someone that's saying like, you know, I love fishing these, these rivers year round. I love the technical, technical nymph fishing and small dry fly fishing. What's the ideal rod? Again, we're back to that softer, more medium, medium, fast action fly rod. If you're saying, you know, I live over in Glenwood Springs, and I, I primarily fish out of my drift boat, and I love baiting and streamers. Well, now we're back to a nine foot six weight or nine foot seven weight. So this is where really it's not just where you're fishing; it's it's how you're fishing, where you're going to dictate what that ideal rod is. So when you're thinking about identify that, hey, I'm, I think I need a new flower. I think I need to expand my rod quiver. You got to start asking yourself, well, where am I fishing? And then how do I like to fish on those rivers where I, I'm, I'm going to be fishing most, most typically? This is, a, this is a good question from Brendan. A little bit of a controversial question, maybe. Uh, is there a rod a lot of people say you should have for Colorado that you disagree with? 
or just one app, a one application rod that you think is overhyped? And so one rod that's overhyped? Yeah, like a, a rod that's meant for a app, certain application. Do you think there's anything that's overhyped? I don't really think there's anything that's that's been overhyped. I think it's more a matter of, you know, I think lately we see that there's kind of transitions in what rod companies think is is cool or valuable. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the standard fast action rod, so the H, the, let's call it the H3, the Sage X, the Scott Radian, um, you know, those are going to be the flagship rods that, you know, are there, what we see, in, in, at least from a, a fly shop sales standpoint, that's where the bulk of our sales always are is in the fast action rod category, because when we're talking application, fast action rods are going to be a multi-application flyer. We're back to that nine foot five weight where fast action rods are going to do everything really, you know, they're not going to do everything well, but they're going to do everything you need it to do. You're always going to find things that they excel at or, they, or they're not so great at, but it's going to be that multi-application flyer rod. Once we start getting into something like the Sage Igniter, which is in that ultra fast action category, or the Salt HD, or the Scott G, or the, the Scott F series, or fiberglass series, or the butter stick from Reddington. Now we're getting into the fly rods that have a very specific application where I can't take that Sage Igniter and go fish 7X Tippet in Cheese and King. I'm going to lose every single fish and break off all the time because that tip just isn't made for lighter weight tippets. And I can't similarly take my, you know, fiberglass fly rod and go fish a giant, uh, you know, articulated, you know, size four streamer. That's just not going to work. So I think that the only thing I'd say is overhyped is the idea that every, you know, that the, the, you know, the fast action nine foot five weight, nine foot six weight is the only fly rod that you need. That's just not true. And I think what we have seen is that as soon as people start experiencing what fishing is like with a different fly rod or a lighter fly rod or a fly rod that's more made for a specific application, that their time on the water is enhanced. And a great example for me was I got a little seven and a half foot three weight Sage X and I got it, you know, just kind of as a small stream rod. And one day I was go, I went up to Decker's with my son and unbeknownst to me, I, I forgot my rod bag. And the only rod I had with me was this little seven and a half foot three weight at Decker's and the flows were about 100 CFS and you know I kind of thought well shoot my day shot and all I have is this little three weight I'm at Decker's that has actually become if it flows are 150 CFS or below all I fish is my seven and a half foot three weight Sage X because it does it, it, it casts all the nymph rings I needed to do and all of a sudden those 12 inch Decker's rainbows and browns don't feel quite so small on my nine foot like they did on my nine foot five weight it's a true you know the, the seven and a half foot three weight and a quick Paul reel all of a sudden, that 12-inch trout really is its a, it's a lot more entertaining, and Deckers is a lot more fun to fish because I found a way to enhance my time with a different, more specific fly rod for that application. I don't know if I should ask this question, but I'm going to. Uh, Dan asks, are moonshine rods any good? All right, so now we're getting into a different conversation where it's a matter of where a fly rod is made. So I've always loved fly fishing because with rods, reels, you know, waders, when you talk about sims, we can focus on buying things to sell to our customers that are made here in the USA. And I think, you know, we all love supporting local and, you know, supporting, you know, domestic manufacturing, I think is something that we should all focus on when we can. The realities of fly rods are it's a very hands-on manufacturing process. It's somewhere between 35 and 45 people, depending on the company and the different processes that they have, are going to touch a fly rod through the manufacturing process. So from rolling the graphite onto the mandrel, putting it in the oven, bringing it out, you know, breaking down the fiberglass off of it, wrapping it, putting the cork on it, every one of these is a, is a different step that someone else is doing. So when you're talking a fly reel, for example, we're talking about putting a piece of bar stock aluminum into a CNC milling machine. Well, and then someone just pressing the go button, the where that machine is doesn't make as much of a difference. So from a real standpoint, we've seen that, you know, reels that are made in Korea, like Cheekies and others are, and, and Sage Reels, for example, they're, the quality of manufacturing and machining is really quite exceptional. And so you can get a really good reel that's made overseas for less money than you're going to pay for a USA made reel. It's just, it, it, it's a matter of fact. Do I still think the USA made reels are better? Absolutely. But can you get something quality from overseas? A hundred percent. Fly rods are a different story because it's a matter, there's there's so much technology from the type of graphite you're using. So for Sage, for example, 
Dave Bean located on Bainbridge Island, Washington, right across the Puget Sound from Boeing, they've got a, an exclusive relationship with Boeing where they source all their graphite from Boeing. So they get graphite that is way technologically advanced from everything that, say, a Moonshine or a Temple Fork Outfitters is going to use. They're using very generic graphite. They're using generic rod tapers. And they're not, there's not a lot of R&D, research and development, that goes into it. Another, you know, back to Sage again. Sage has a re- an R&D team of four individuals that all they do day in and day out is they have a lab where they're testing different graphite materials, different resins. Um, they're testing different tapers. And every fly rod goes through different stages of design and, and R&D before it ever hits the consumer's hands. Companies like TFO, Moonshine, you know, they just don't put that much technology and in, in research and development into their fly rod manufacturing, not because they don't want to, but because they can't, because they're not sitting at the factory in China making those fly rods. The truth of the matter is I could source the exact same rod blanks that Moonshine is using, slap a trout fly fishing label on it, and sell it to you and make, you know, really good margins on it. But the reason that we don't is because the quality of those rods isn't as good as something that you're going to find here in the United States. It just isn't. I mean, it's a matter of fact, if I, if I put a Moonshine rod and I put a, a Sage X or, a, a, you know, a high-end, you know, rod that's made here in the States, you will, I mean, the difference is night and day. So if you're on a budget and, you know, a 500 or, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred dollar rod just isn't in the budget, which we totally understand, there are some really good options out there that are going to be a lot more affordable, but you want to make sure that you're getting something that actually has some R&D, some, some, you know, some purpose to it. So our, you know, overseas rod brand that we carry, we do Orbis, um, which has the clear water, which is a uh, $199 rod, which is really, really good quality. And the reason it's good is because you have Orbis who makes all their other rods in Manchester, Vermont. They're applying their own rod technology and just having this rod sourced overseas. The other company we feel that does an exceptional job of making rods overseas is Reddington. So Reddington is a, is a part of the parent of the far bank, you know, greater parent company that is Sage, Reddington, and Rio. So Reddington all of a sudden gets the benefit of all of Sage's R&D that they do for their fly rods. And they're basically applying the technology and everything that they know from Sage. And they're just having their Reddington rods made overseas. So a very different story with Orbis and Sage and, and Reddington because they have a, a rod company, a rod manufacturing facility in the United States where they're doing their research and development. And they're just having the fly rods made overseas. Temple Fork, Moonshine. All of those companies, they don't have the ability to do the research and development here in the United States. Thus, the quality and the overall action of the fly rods isn't going to be as good as what you're going to find with, with those other options I just spoke about. Uh, Robert Gonzalez asks, uh, how do you feel about the fighting butt on a nine-foot five weight? Fighting butts. I think fighting butts when I'm fishing tarpon with my 11 weight are great when I can stick that rod into my gut and get, you know, have a little bit of leverage to fight that fish. So, in, you know, in big game fly rods, because it's not just saltwater, it may be peacock bass or golden dorado or, or pike or whatever it may be. I do think in like rod seven weight and up, fighting butts make a lot of sense. Fighting butts in six weights and five weights, I personally don't like them. I think that the fighting butt is just, it's a long extension. It, it's just one more thing that my fly line, or my, sorry, yeah, the fly line is going to get wrapped around. Um, so I don't think that they're very necessary because most of the time the fish you're catching with a, a five weight or a six weight aren't anything big enough that necessitates you, you, you know, you needing that fighting butt. But again, it's all personal preference. I think that some people really just like having that little bit of extra length of the rod. They like having, you know, the, a fighting butt's going to necessitate you're going to probably need a little bit of a bigger reel on there just to be able to balance the rod out appropriately. So some people just like kind of a little bit of the bigger feel of having a, fi- a fighting butt on their five or six weight. So personally, I don't like it. But again, it's, you know, fly rods are all about personal preference. It's not about, you know, just because your buddy likes it doesn't mean you're going to like it as well. Um, fiberglass rods. Fiberglass rods application for them do you feel uh do you feel like they have application in larger sizes or do you uh, prefer them in the smaller sizes so fiberglass is kind of like click paul so you know i love click paul reels because it adds an element of challenge to landing a fish when you don't have a drag system um you know about 
well, four years ago, I got a, a, a nine weight um, Epic glass rods. So Epic, they're, they're fiberglass rods that we source. They're actually made down in New Zealand. Um, we we uh, import them here to the shop. We're a few domestic dealers of that particular company. But they have a little bit of a faster action glass. Orvis has a little bit of a faster action glass as well. So that nine foot nine weight, I love using that. I take it on every saltwater trip I go on. So I've caught bonefish on it. I've caught redfish on it. I've yet to catch a permit on it. So I think glass in the, you know, as long as you're sizing it up to meet the application and the, the species you're fishing for, I think, you know, fiberglass is a, is a type of rod that you can fish for trout all the way to tarpon. You just have to have the right size for it. And we know there are plenty of anglers that are fiberglass fanatics and they that's all they fish. So it's just a matter of, you know, are you going to be able to fish a big articulated streamer with a sink tip on a fiberglass? No. Are you going to be able to fish a little bully booger? Absolutely. So again, I mean, it's what you're going to be able to do with the rod if it's if it's a fiberglass rod is going to be limited. But as long as you're you're okay with fishing within those limitations, it's a great option, a great way to you know find a rod that's going to enhance your time on the water. Uh, ten foot rods applications for ten foot rods. So ten footers are you know they're great for extra reach. So I'm fishing Cheeseman, and I you know. I want to get to that seam on the other side of that rock, but I can't get out. I can't wait anymore. I'm going to go over my head. That extra 12 inches is going to give you more reach. Um, they're really good also for roll casting. So they're not a great dry fly presentation rod, but 10 foot rods roll cast really well. So if you think about it, I mean, spay rods, the reason spay rods are so can, can cast away they do is because you're talking rods that are anywhere from 11 to 14 feet in length. So all that extra length is going to allow you a lot more line control when it comes to roll casting. So really good for nymphing and not having to do a lot of overhand casting. Good for, you know, a single hand spay where you're just wanting to kind of swing streamers, say on the lower Colorado, for example. Um, and the other application for 10-foot rods is going to be fishing out of pontoon boats and belly boats. So it's going to give you an extra 12 inches of, you know, length where if I'm in a belly boat and so all of a sudden I'm not standing up, I'm in my own belly from where the surface of the water is, that extra, you know, 12 inches is going to give me a little bit more clearance when I'm trying to cast out in a, in a still water environment. 10-foot rods are not going to be in that multi-application field. I think, you know, unlike, you know, they're going to have a little bit more of a broad um, application. We just identified they're great for, for check nymphing, for high stick nymphing. They're great for single-hand spay and swinging streamers, and they're great for still water applications as well as, you know, pike and bass and things like that. So they're, they, they do have a good amount of application to it, but it's not going to be a rod that you're going to want to go finish a hopper dropper or a decker's in July. It's just not going to be a good rod for that. So as long as you're, you know, what I just identified as good applications for 10 footers is kind of in your sphere of what you're looking for. Awesome. If it's, if you're looking for that general multi-purpose application, that's going to kind of be more, you know, dry fly, technical limping, not so much. Uh, Thomas Waldron is back with another question. He wants to know what the most versatile uh, fly rod from Sage is. The most versatile fly rod from Sage so then, I mean, if we're talking, you know, at every price point, so you'll have the foundation, um, then you'll have the response, then you'll have the Sage X. Those are going to be kind of their three most, you know, multi-application fly rods that they've got. You know, you've got the payload, that's going to be more of a streamer, kind of big fly, you know, you know, the, the payload would be great for streamer fishing, great for still water species. Um, you know, the Trout LL is going to be much more of a presentation you know, lightweight nymph, dry fly presentation kind of fly rod. So if you're looking for multi-application, the foundation, the response, and then the um, X are going to be the, the, the most multi-application. Uh, so if you're uh, fishing ice off, ice off is uh, coming up here for a lot of the still waters. Um, from the shore, what, uh, what rod would you choose? What length, weight, and maybe brand? So brand, I don't want to ever, we're, you know, when we're talking application, brand isn't an important, you know, point of the conversation. You know, anytime we're, we're, we're fly rod buying process, the first is identifying what your price point is going to be, what the application of the fly rod is going to be. And then we start talking about the different brands and the different options. And then ideally, we want you to cast those fly rods so that you can identify the brand that meets your casting stroke or, or benefits your casting stroke the best. So it's not necessarily about the brand. Now we're talking still water applications. Well, now again, we got to kind of whittle it down further than just still water. Are we talking 
am I going to be fishing high country still water or am I going to be catch, you know, fishing, you know, Rocky Mountain Arsenal, you know, front range still water? Because now we're talking if it's high country, something like a three or a four weight when you're catching little tiny range, you know, little trout is going to be much more ideal. If we're talking fishing front range, well, now we're talking a completely different species set. So we're now going to need to be talking about like a six or a seven, possibly an eight weight if we're going really big fish. So I think what you want to look for in a still water rod is, is going to be length. So, you know, nine foot is usually, unless you're talking high country, where you want something a little more compact for hiking. But length is going to give you distance, which is going to always be important in still water because it's not a matter of, you know, fish being right in front of you. You may need to get the fly out 40 feet to where the fish are. So I think for, for still water rods, nine to 10 feet in length is always going to be the most ideal, depending on if you're fishing from shore, I'd say a nine footer. If you're from a boat, I'd go with a 10 footer. Um, and then if we're just saying, let's just talk, you know, still water trout, you know, bigger bodies of water, I would say like a nine foot five weight is usually going to be about the ideal rod that you're going to need. You're, unless you're going to be fishing really, you know, heavy full sink fly lines, then maybe looking at like a nine foot six weight. Um, but for most typical trout, still water applications and nine foot four weight to a nine foot five weight if you're fishing from shore is going to be is going to be good and then i think the rod weight is going to be dictated a lot by the type of flies you're going to be fishing and then the size of fish so some still water fish can be really big so if you're going to be catching you know 18 to 20 inch fish obviously the nine foot five weight is going to be a better application to deal with the larger fish Uh, the NRX five weight, the nine foot five inch five weight, um, they call the tail the like the front range special. Basically, Can you talk a little bit about uh, that rod and its applications. So I think that we're seeing rod companies being more deliberate in the rods they're making, and that they, a, a rod like this, the NRX Plus that we just mentioned, is a great example of. They had the nine foot five weight NRX plus, which is a great rod for distance, for accuracy, for fishing from a drift boat. But what they found is for the wade fishermen in the Southern Rockies, i.e. Colorado, it was just a little bit too stiff of a fly rod. You know, the tip wasn't great for lighter weight tippets, making it not an ideal fly rod for nymph fishing or technical nymphing. So by adding that extra six inches into the fly rod, they've made it into a much more, a little bit softer tip, a little bit more forgiving. So all of a sudden, it does become a true front range special where, I mean, it's a rod that was designed really specifically for the Colorado wade fishermen because, you know, it's the, the nine foot five weight for Montana, Wyoming, Idaho is really ideal. But for our application here in Colorado, it wasn't, it just wasn't right. So that's why they came out with that nine and a half foot five weight to really meet the needs of the Southern Rockies angle. Uh, how about uh, fishing out of a boat? Let's say you're fishing the Colorado um, you know, through the summertime, throwing dro uh, dry droppers. Uh, what would be your preferred uh, length, weight, and, and action that you'd be looking for? So for, you know, what I've got in my drift boat right now, my standard, you know, dr you know drift boat, nine foot, five weight is going to be, the, I'd love the Sage X. Um, I also like the, the Scott Radian. It's, I think, the Radian. Is a little bit of a slower paced at fast action rod, meaning that the casting stroke is a little bit slower with the Radian versus the Sage X. So I also like the NRX Plus is a great one. The H3D from Orvis would be a great one. I think nine foot five weights for most dry dropper fishing in Colorado out of a drift boat is perfect. I think six weights are a little bit overkill. I've got the six, I mean, I've got a six weight, nine foot six weight in my drift boat that I, I reserve for streamers. I've got a eight and a half foot to nine foot four weight, depending on what rod it is, that I'm going to have is more of just an exclusive like dry fly nymphing rig or dry fly rig. Um, but for dry, dry dropper, hopper dropper fishing, I think something that's a faster action rod is always going to be ideal. So those, again, Sage X, Scott Radian, Orbis H3, D, those are going to be better. Not be, you know, One, because it's going to give you more accuracy, where if you're fishing from a drift boat, you know, you want to have that fly sometimes, you know, three to six inches from the bank in order to put it in front of the fish. You know, softer action rods are going to present it delicately, but they're going to be a little tougher to get that precise. The other reality is that, you know, when you're weight fishing, you're staring at one section of water for however long you're going to be there. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the pace of your fishing doesn't matter quite as much. When you're in a drift boat or a raft and you're moving down the river, all of a sudden, I need to be able to pick each little spot along the bank line, each seam, you know, get, you know, along each rock or, or log. So having a rod that's going to have 
faster action, which is going to be faster line pace, which is going to be faster casting stroke, you're going to be able to, to effectively cover more water with a fast action rod than you will be with a slower action rod. So, you know, I had my, my Sage X nine foot five weight. I very rarely fish that rod for anything wave fishing application. I like my Scott Radian, for example, if I'm going to be wave fishing the Colorado with a hopper dropper rig. I like a, a Scott G or a Trout LL if I'm going to be wave fishing deckers because I'm not going to be fishing as large of bugs and the fish are going to be a little bit smaller and the overall river environment is smaller. So, you know, different five weights for different applications for, for you know, three different, you know, two different applications, wave versus float. And then, you know, three different rods for three different sections or three different wave fishing, Colorado fishing applications. We have another spay question. Any thoughts on spay gear in Colorado? So we call it trout spay. It's kind of the, the industry term for, for people that are looking to fish spay rods for, for trout. And what we see there is normally spay rod, trout spays are going to be in that, 10 and a half to 12 foot length, normally 11 foot is kind of that sweet spot. And then we're going to be looking at rod weights of three to maybe six weight, you know, so, you know, like a, the three or four weight little trout spay would be a really good option for fishing, the, you know, deckers, you know, let's say the, the Eagle, the Arkansas, things like that. Five weight would be good for like the lower down on the Arkansas, maybe the Roaring Fork, lower down the Colorado. And then the six weight would be, you know, lower Gunson, lower Colorado, down around like Newcastle, Silton, that area. You know, so it's going to be able to get just more distance because you're in a bigger river environment. So you're not going to, I mean, there is now kind of two distinct, you know, spay categories. You have traditional spay and then you have trout spay. And those are going to be very different based off of the species ultimately you're fishing for. Um, so, I mean, like Sage, for example, they, they do a great job with their spay rods. I mean, they've got a trout spay. Um, line of rods in the Sage X, and they've got a full spay line when they're going to be, they're not all in the same family. They're very distinctly different. So it's a, it's a fun way to finish. I mean, I think it's, you know, you're very dead. You're, you're going to be very committed to just swinging flies. There's no way if all of a sudden a nice bluing all of that pops that you're going to be able to switch up to a dry fly. But as long as you're okay being committed to swinging streamers all day, you know, it's an, it's an incredibly effective way to fish for trout here in Colorado and one that not a lot of people have adopted. Uh, Thomas is back, and he's talking about different application. If you're a guide, what different application rods would you be uh, putting in your quiver for your clients? For for guides, or yeah, was a question? Yeah, if you're a guide, like what what's your quiver going to look like? What different applications um, are you going to be uh, covering? Well, I know for, for us, we use Scott Flex flat rods and Ross Gunnison reels on all of our guide rods. Um, we, you know, so it's a nine foot five weight multi application mid price point rod. The reel is just bomb proof. It can, you know, take a beat and keep going day in and day out. So for us, it's a matter of really durability and it's overall multi application. Now, that's what we provide to our guides to use on with our clients on all of our guided trips. And certainly, you know, I've been on other trips where, you know, I've got my nine foot five weight in the boat. And then later in the day, we want to throw streamers, but I didn't bring my streamer rod. Well, any good guy's going to have a nine foot six weight or a nine foot seven weight rigged up with a streamer rod ready to hand you so that you can handle, you know, fishing those bigger bucks. Um, you know, so I think really for guides, mostly it's about, you know, trying to find that one rod that's going to do as much possible application as possible, which typically is going to be depending on where you are, a nine foot four weight to a nine foot five weight, um, you know, Having, but then I think if you want to expand that rod quiver beyond just that one rod and be able to have things for your clients to be able to enhance their time on the water, maybe increase that tip amount at the end of the day, then start thinking about what are the other applications that I'm going to be potentially facing on a particular body of water. So if I'm a, if I'm a guide that's, you know, guiding on the Gunnison, well, I probably should have a, a streamer rod ready to go because that's typically a rod that most people aren't going to have with them. If I'm a guide up on the, the South Platte at Deckers, well, maybe having like an, you know, a softer presentation oriented four weight for when you see those dry fly hatches coming off. Again, something that's going to allow the fly a lot better and then potentially have a better chance of hooking up to that fish. So I think it's, you know, to, to Thomas's question, I think if you are a guy, Thomas, think about where you're fishing, what, you know, what situations you and your clients are facing on a daily basis. And I think that'll help you understand what that, added that that second or third rod to your quiver that you could add to make sure your clients are really having an awesome day in the water 
Uh, no current questions right now. I have a personal question, though. Um, have you tried any other flavor of La Croix other than Pamplemousse? Um, I have. I, you know, lime is, is I'm, I'm, I'm agreeable to lime. Key lime was just a little bit too much for me. So, no, I'm, I'm pretty much a, a Pamplemousse, you know, aficionado of, of La Croix. Respect. Uh, All right, yeah. I'll try to change it up for a little more as well. <laughs> the, cran, the cran raspberry is pretty good. Just saying. I was forced into that corner uh, with the shortages we've uh, been experiencing in the grocery store. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're still able to source it. Small streams. Uh, fly rod length for small streams. I think it's a matter of, I mean, small streams, you're going to want something that's a little bit shorter. It's just going to make the fly rod a lot more manageable on those shorter streams. So I think the longest you want for a small, small creek rod would be eight feet. Um, the shortest you're going to want would be, you know, six and a half to seven feet. I've always found that that seven to seven and a half foot, you know, three weight is going to be really your ideal rod. Now, if you're someone who's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I like fishing creeks, but I'm mostly I'm going to keep walking up until I get to that high country lake. Then I'd probably say going with that something a little bit longer, like an eight footer. It's just going to make fishing the lakes a lot more a lot more manageable than a smaller rod will just because an eight foot rod is going to be able to cast further than a seven or seven and a half foot rod. But if you're someone who's just fishing, like I love, like if you're someone who just wants to fish Bear Creek, well, Bear Creek is one of those rivers where with lots of, you know, overhangs, tight spots. So then like a six and a half to seven foot rod is going to be a more ideal rod for, for Bear Creek. Whereas if I'm looking for a rod, you know, a rod for say Clear Creek or Deckers, well, now that seven and a half foot to eight foot rod is going to be more ideal. So, Again, you gotta when you're thinking that you know, take small creek and then whittle it down further to what, what small creeks do you think you're gonna be fishing? And that'll help you identify or help us help you identify what that ideal length for that small creek rod is gonna be. Uh, Thomas is back with another question. He he's asking, what's your favorite whiskey? My favorite whiskey, Knob Creek. Knob Creek. Well, that's it. A twofold. Weller when I can find it. Which is normal around holidays, so I'm you know normally out of Weller you know around this time, and then we, we move over to Knob Creek. Also, although I've got a, a bottle of Weller up in Scoot, and I'm, I'm looking to enjoy here as soon as I get back up there. Don't, don't forget about Lock, uh, our good friend Lock. What's that? Our good friend Lock, Lock whiskey. That's pretty good. That's a good one too. Yeah. I'm not the biggest rye guy, but I, I will say if, if if I'm gonna drink rye whiskey, it's gonna be Lock. Yeah. Uh. Raven says, "Watching me, <laughs> watching this makes me realize I need to buy more fly rods." <laughs> Look, fly rods are never. It's not a matter of like I. I think what, what people need to realize is it's we get. I mean, there's fly fishing is an inherently can be all the fishing really is going to can get into an expensive sport if you allow it to do it. We're here to help be able to enhance your time on the waters, and by that I mean. Let's say that you're someone who's like, man, I'm really with this whole stay at home in order. I don't feel good about leaving Denver, but I really want to get out fishing. Well, there's great, you know, lower price point, six and seven weight options that would allow you to get out and go fish the Denver South Platte or any of the still waters around town. That doesn't mean you need to break the bank. So just because you have a premium nine foot five weight, let's say, it doesn't mean that every single rod you need to have needs to be in that premium category. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can help get you into other rods at lesser price points that allow you to try some different things or just see how something can, you know, a lighter weight rod at Deckers can really make fishing up there a whole lot more fun than fishing with your nine foot five weight. These are unrelated questions to fly rods, but uh, Dan and Kat are both asking, uh, are we still moving in June and how's everything progressing with the new location? So we're, we're, we're coming along, um, you know, we're, we're going through all of our fixture fabrication right now. So we're thinking that, you know, mid June is still going to be when we will be able to open the new store. Um, you know, it'll kind of have to be seen what, what the retail environment in Denver looks like around that time. Um, we're hopeful that, you know, as, as restrictions get eased a little bit, that outdoor Asian retail stores like Trout's, um, we'll possibly be able to open our doors to customers sometime in the early part of May is what we're starting to hear and understand. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really, we're guys, we're taking everything like everyone else day to day, week to week. Um, you know, our kind of goal line right now is end of April and seeing what the state city and state are going to allow us to do. 
Um, our goal is to, you know, be open in, in that June time frame, barring any potential sourcing issues. But we're working, you know, we've got construction going on day in and day out. It's going to be a really exciting project that we're super excited to share with all, with all of our customers, friends, and family. Uh, Raven Call asked, "What does Tukey think about Tenkara rods?" Tukey, man, back to Cuba. Uh, Tenkara. It's like asking a skier what they think of snowboarding. I mean, it's it's completely different. I think, and I'll use that snowboarding, skiing, towel marking, apple, you know, example where the end goal is we want to slide down on snow. That's it. Otherwise, there's nothing similar about any three of those applications. The gear is different. The technique is different. Everything about it is different. So I think that if we look at fly fishing, we look at conventional fishing, so spin fishing, you know, bait fishing, um, and then tent car would be over here as a, as a third way to fish. So the end goal for all fishing is we want to catch fish. Well, tent car, conventional fishing, and fly fishing are three different ways that you can do it. The only similarity between tenkara fishing and fly fishing is we use artificial flies. That's it. There's no casting in tenkara. There's no mending in tenkara. There's no roll casting in tenkara. Tenkara is about high stick, you know, dangling your fly right on the surface of the water and hoping a fish is going to come up and eat it. That's, that's tenkara. So there's really, I don't like associating tenkara and fly fishing because they're really very, very different in, in all from application to technique. Um, everything is completely different. Uh, Brendan G. Oh, Dan, Dan said, uh, if we need help with the move, he's in. <laughs> but Brendan G. said, uh, so shout out to Dan for that. Brendan G. said, the internet has been flooded with advice of, uh, on how to help local fly shops and guides. Uh, from the horse's mouth, what's the best thing we can do to help you all and your staff? Well, I really appreciate that question. I think that this whole situation is, you know, we're in uncharted territory for all of us. And from a business owner, I mean, I remember coming back in, I took my son fishing for a day up at Decker's on um, the day that the mayor announced the closure of all restaurants and bars around town. And I remember getting into the cell service and getting that news and just this sinking feeling in my gut because I knew what was about to happen. I knew that retail was, was inevitably going to be next. Um, it's been a really crazy four weeks for us doing business and transacting with all of you guys in this virtual environment without being able to interact and talk. I mean, I've got most of my staff is working remotely from home. There's anywhere from two to three of us in the shop every day processing online orders and just trying to keep the Trout's brand moving forward and keep doing things for you guys. You know, for me, this isn't the first major, you know, hit that we've taken. We've had droughts. We've had the, the Great Recession. I mean, there's We've had big economic social issues that we've had to combat. And I think what we've found is that our role in this in, in situations like this is, yeah, we need help, but we're also here to help you. Um, you know, there's a lot of industries out there that are getting hit a lot harder by this than, than, than fly fishing retailers. And then while we're not deemed as essential, I think if you talk to any fly shop owner across the country during the month of March, kind of when everyone saw what was going to happen, business was booming. We had, we were having one of the best marches that we've ever had. And although we haven't been able to open our doors, we're still transacting with everyone on a daily basis. And so we've had to contract. Um, we're very fortunate that we were able to get our payroll protection loan. So I'm able to bring a lot of my staff back right now at full salary and full pay. So I'm very, very pleased that we're able to get a lot of our people back to work. So if you want to support us, just let us support you. You know, let us help get you out on the water. Let us help supply you with those flies. Um, you know, if you're someone who's going to get a stimulus check and you, you know, maybe a little bit left over to do something nice for yourself, well, think about maybe buying that other fly rod that maybe will help enhance your time on the water. Um, you know, I think fly shops, in my opinion, as long as you're doing your normal transacting with us on, you know, to get yourself out on the water, which is something that we all should be doing right now for our mental health, that's all you can do to support fly shops. Guides, outfitters, destination travel, that's a completely different scenario. My guides are completely sidelined right now. I uh, feel that we can, you know, do guided trips and, and practice proper social distancing and do it in a safe manner. Um, but the reality is it's just not the, you know, not doing it right now just because there's just no demand for it obviously given what's going on um outfitters you know lodges these guys i mean everyone is completely sidelined right now there's no guest fishing there's no travel going on 
So like, for example, what we're doing right now is we're offering 15% off all of our guided trips. So the best thing you can do to help us right now, buy a guided trip at a discount. You don't have to select the date. At, you know, when you, when you purchase the trip, you do this all online. You go to our gift card section of our website. You'll see where you can buy a gift card for a guided trip at that 15% discounted rate. Um, and then when, when, you know, when all the, the dust settles and we're able to get out and start doing things normally again, you've got a gift card for a guided trip that's going to be guaranteed work for my guys. So I think that's one thing that you can do to, to assist my guys. Um, we're also writing a special promo right now. Able River Ranch, one of our private water um, options, we're, we're able to offer a 33% discount on the rod fees. Uh, so all of a sudden, now you get on Able River Ranch for $100 a person instead of $150, and we're giving you that 15% off guided trip rate. So, you know, great options for someone to get out on the water, um, enjoy some private water fishing. So, I mean, that's one thing you can do. But like I said, I think it's – we're not asking people to buy gift cards. We're not asking people to, to you know, you know – give money to a GoFundMe page, just transact with us, just support us. Cause all we're trying to do on a daily basis is support all of our customers with the sequester series, with our new current podcast, um, with all the great content Yvonne's putting out, you know, we feel like our responsibility is to support you guys as much as you're trying to support us. Uh, Randy has a question and it's somewhat related to application, but it's more of a fly line question. Um, so he needs a three weight fly line for a small stream in smaller mid-sized rivers, should he look at the Rio Creek line or the Trout LT, or is there another line you should uh, you might suggest? Uh, and then um, he was thinking about oversizing it to a four-weight line. Uh, is that a good or bad idea? So let's just go oversizing. Don't ever oversize rods. There is there is not a fly on the market today that necessitates you overlining. And I don't know exactly where this idea of overlining rods you know, ultimately came from, but all it does is it decreases the performance of any fly rod. It was just, for example, like the Sage Ignite. So super fast action fly rod. A lot of people think, well, I need to put it, if I have a five weight, I need to put a six weight on it. No. Rio and Scientific Angler, you have the MPX from Scientific Angler and you have the Rio Grand from Rio. Those are heavier five weight, six weight, whatever fly lines. So that means there are fly lines that are going to always match the action of a fly rod in that rod weight. So whether trout or saltwater, Please, please, please don't ever overline your rods. If you feel like you need to overline your rods, most oftentimes you just need a casting lesson. You need to figure out there's something in your casting stroke that isn't quite right. You're either dropping your rod tip, you're not pausing enough on your back cast, you're not accelerating the fly rod properly. Don't overline fly rods, it's just not the proper thing to do. And back to your question about the three weight though, I think that it, again, let's, let's kind of whittle it down. So you have a three weight you use on small creeks. Is it a faster action three weight or is it more of like a fiberglass three weight? If it's a fiberglass three weight, I would say the creek line from Rio would be ideal. If we're talking about, say, like my seven and a half foot three weight Sage X, I'm going to go with the Trout LT. So, you know, you got to keep whittling, you know, the application, whether it's fly line or the fly rod, keep whittling it down until you get really to the fine, you know, the fine minute applications and where you're going to be fishing with it. Uh I don't know how to pronounce his name. I Iman, Iman, Iman uh, says, do you suggest factory or annual maintenance for very active rods? I mean, the only thing you could, I, there's really no way to, to maintain a fly rod. I mean, if you want, you can use dish soap and a, and a light rag, and that'll clean the cork of your fly rod real nicely. So if you're someone who's, you know, you got a lot of hand grease or sun sand lotion grease on your, the cork and it gets a little bit, you know, dark and stained. That's one thing that you can do. But otherwise, you know, there's, there isn't much you can do for a fly rod other than, you know, be careful how you store it. You know, I know I used to put a lot of fly rods through the, the back window of my truck on, on dirt roads, and so there was a lot of chatter of the fly rod. What I found is that probably once a year, that's exactly where my fly rods were breaking at some point in time. Um, so, you know, I know also with my, my used to have a Titan rod vault, you know, that, that original series. Uh, they didn't do a really good job of taking care of fly rods, so the, the, it got banged up really bad. You know, lots of scrapes and, and you know, just blemishes on the fly rod from transporting and that. So I think you know, the best thing you can do is fly rod, you know, dry it out, put it back into the rod tube. I've seen people that wet rods back in the rod sock, back in the rod tube. The wood swells to the point where the real seat doesn't work anymore. I've had that happen to me once. Um, so there's really no way to send a rod back to get maintained because there could be so many different things, and the only way... To, 
to know what there's an issue with the rod is ultimately probably when it breaks, and then it has to go back anyway. Uh, Jay Rosenth, 84, is asking, it's a good question. Would you ever buy a rod online without coming in to cast it or test it out first? Uh, seems like something you want to hold and cast before you buy. So, anecdotal little story. So back, you know, probably 2006. No, it was actually 2005. It was the very first year that I owned trouts when we were over on Old South Gaylor Street. Um, we were a Winston dealer. The Boron, the 2X, was, it was a brand new flower out on the market. It was kind of the hot thing. Everyone wanted it. Um, the B2X is what we, we called it back then. And a guy came in and he said, I, I want a nine foot five way B2X. And I go, well, great. Here, I've got one right here. Let's go outside and cast. He goes, no, no, no. My buddy told me I love it. I'm just going to wrap it up. I'm ready to go. So him the rod. Two weeks later, he comes back in. I asked him, so how, how's the new rod? What do you think? He goes, I hate it. Rod, it doesn't do what I wanted to. It's not accurate. I, I, I fished it one day. I haven't fished it since. We ended up taking the rod back and helping him get into a new one. But the point of the story was he just went off of what his buddy told him. Don't ever go off what your buddy told you. Don't online rod reviews, they don't matter. You know, the the, the five weight shootouts, they don't matter. What you don't realize about say, those, those five weight shootouts, for example, they use the exact same fly line on all of those five weight fly rods. Bad idea. You have to match the fly rod and the fly line to get the ultimate performance out of your fly rod. So use the on use online for research. I mean, whether it's you know researching what, what influencers are saying about it on social media looking at what fly shops or a, or a guide may say about it. Sure, do some research. You can get an idea that if everyone online is saying, I don't like this rod, well, then maybe it is true that it's not a great rod. But if some people are saying they like it, some people are saying they don't, that really isn't telling you a whole lot. You do, I mean, I, the ideal way to buy a fly rod is come in, let's talk about your price point. What is your budget? Let's talk about what the application of the fly rod is going to be, where you're going to be fishing that fly rod. And then we're going to whittle it down. We're probably going to get somewhere between three and five rods, depending on different brands, lengths, actions. We'll go outside. We cast every single one. And then we'll start removing from the mix until we've got, you know, one or two fly rods. And then you make your choice. That's the ideal way to buy a fly rod. Now, if you're someone that lives in the middle of nowhere or you're in the middle of, of a stay in place order and you just can't get to your local fly shop right now to buy a rod, we understand that we're working with customers on a daily basis to help work through this situation. So maybe it's something where, you know, we're going to talk through what your desired, you know, end application, where you're going to be fishing, all of those minute details. And we're going to, I feel confident that myself and my staff know enough about rods, rod actions, that we're going to be able to get pretty darn close. We'll send you the rod, let you cast it, you know, in your yard, just grass cast it. And if you don't like it, we can send it back and work through that process. Uh, but it is just be cautious just buying a rod based off of what someone says online because it really, what, what one person likes is very different from another. And if it was as simple as just telling you that there, if there was just one rod that met everyone's needs, I wouldn't need to have all of these different rods from all these different brands to offer because there would just be that one, you know, unicorn flower that's going to do everything. It's not true. Every brand, Winston, Scott, Orvis, Sage, Loomis, they're all going to meet the needs and casting strokes of different anglers, which is why we carry all those different brands. Jake is asking, uh, is it appropriate to ask about rod cork grips, different styles of wells and application of each? And uh, he also wanted you to touch on fighting butts uh, as well. So let's just, we'll, we'll go through a couple do this without breaking anything so you have a, a standard rod grip so this is a cigar grip i you know because it looks ideally like a cigar so this is going to be your most kind of standard trout grip um, you're going to see on, on trout rods today um a couple years ago when stage came out with the one and now it's the x so they went with what's called the half wells. So a little bit of a, of a larger kind of uh, kind of profile on the front there makes it a little bit better for just kind of a little bit more of a thumb hold or you know kind of a thumb position for, for you know proper rod. Fit. So that's going to be the the half wells, and then you go to something you get into the bigger rod categories, and this is going to be the Scott title, and then you've got the full full wells. So I've got a call coming in, so I'm going to have to.
All right, sorry about that. I had a, a phone call come in and I hit the wrong button. All right, so are we good, are we good Yvonne? Yeah, I'm alive. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. I had a, another call come in on my phone, and I pressed the wrong button. So we, we were going over the different grips. So we had uh, just gone over the, the half wells. So this is a stage X here. Um, that's going to be pretty standard on a lot of trout rods. That half wells grip these days. Most companies are doing that. And then you would have this is going to be a full wells grip. And this is going to be what you're going to see on on larger saltwater rods. Now, one thing you'll notice on this rod is a, kind of a large bump in the middle there. The reason for that is it's it's going to you have to grip the rod. Not you don't have to squeeze quite as tight to get a good hard grip on the rod so for someone in a, in a big game saltwater environment it just leads to less hand fatigue on a daily basis with bigger rods bigger flies bigger fish um so the, the the type of rod grip it's really a matter of personal preference there isn't one that's better than than the other you're going to see you know either a cigar grip or a half wells grip on all freshwater trout oriented fly rods and you're going to see the big you know full wells grip on all the bigger game fly rods in terms of fighting butt, and just so we're all on the same page, this is the fighting butt. You're going to see this. Some rods, like Sage has a, a, a nine for a eight and a half foot five weight in the X that's got a, a fighting butt on it. You're really rarely going to see any fighting butts on anything lower than a five weight. Um, once you get into seven weights, they become pretty standard. And it's hard to find a seven weight that doesn't have a fighting butt on it. Six weights, you're normally going to have an option of whether you want it or not. I, as I noted earlier in the presentation today, I personally, in trout rods, I don't like the fighting butt. I think it's completely overkill and unnecessary. With that said, I know plenty of people that really do like the fighting butt. Um, so it's really personal preference. I just don't think that there's not a species that you're going to catch with a five weight or a six weight that necessitate. You know, the whole idea of the fighting butt is you can take it and, and kind of put it right into the, in your gut when you're fighting a fish. gives you a little bit of extra leverage. You don't really need to do that when it comes to trout, bass, uh, uh, you know, those other species you're going to catch with a five or six weight. All right, we got some more questions. Um, uh, Thomas asks, what's your best advice for someone to be tr uh, trying to become a guide? Best advice for becoming a guide? Well, so when I became a guide, I did a, an, an ore certification school up with, it was Gorsuch Outfitters back in 99 when I got into guiding. Um, and it was kind of the original quote unquote guide school. And all we really learned was, you know, how to row a boat and, and to become certified. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, true, you know, education to be a guide out there. We do have our own guide academy that we're offering this spring. Um, we had to postpone it due to the same place and everything going on. We are going to be offering that once we can get out. Um, and the idea of our guide school is, A, we're going to certify you to be a certified or oarsman in Colorado, which allows you to, to do commercially guided trips, whether it's rafting or fishing. But then we're going to go a lot more into it. We're going to go over how to, how to uh, offer a casting clinic at the beginning of the day, how to, how, to, what, you know, how to organize and facilitate a guided trip in terms of, you know, what are you going to do for the first hour? How do you maintain or manage the, the, the water that you're going to be fishing? Um, for example, you know, you don't want to go immediately to the spot where you know there's going to be fish. You want to kind of allow your clients to work through, you know, make, get the bird's nest, work through the casting. So that by the time they get to the spot where they're going to be, you know, in the best position to catch a fish, they're going to be ready to do so. Um, we're going to even go as far as to how do you set up a riverside, a proper riverside lunch so that you're really offering that enhanced experience. So guide schools are a great way to kind of get your foot in the door. I know for us, you know, we're looking at, um, be offering people a, you know, if you are someone that excels in our guide school, there will likely be a job for you on the back end of that. Or you can take the skill set that we offer, that we taught you, and, you know, take it up to Montana and try to find an outfit. But ultimately what it takes is just angling experience. You need to, I mean, you need to be the knowledgeable expert. So whether it's a never, ever angler or some guy who's been fishing for 50 years, you need to know more than he does. You need to be able to put them on the fish. So you need to be able to, I mean, like we always say with our guys, there are no fish days. Now, you may not land, your client may not land a fish, but your client will hook a fish because you know how to facilitate them at least getting a fish on the end of their line. Landing a fish, you know, that's it. That's up to the client. They've got to do everything right in order to do that. 
but we don't have no hook days. We always hook fish because our guides know no matter what river it is, how to get into fish. They know where they're located. They know what they're eat, feeding on. They know how to rig. They know where to put their client. So, you know, test your skills out. You know, when we hire guides, it's not just, you know, sure you're on board, go out and take our clients out. First you have to do is you have to do a mock guided trip with, with one of our head guides where you go out with either my head Frisco or my head Denver guide, and they're going to pretend to be a client and they're going to expect that you're going to be able to get them into fish on any river that we guide on. And if you can pass that test, then you do some shadows where you're going to shadow some of our, our senior guides so that you understand the processes of our day, how you get liability waiver signed, how you start the day off, when you do lunch. And then once the, the senior guides sign you off, then you start conducting trips all on your own. So, you know, for us, we are an outfitting service that's all about quality over quantity, i.e., I don't want to have 20. I mean, I have 10 guides in Denver. I have 10 guides in Frisco, and that's it. And we have to, you know, we turn away trips every single year, multiple, you know, we, we sell out all the time. And the reason that I don't want to hire more guides is because I don't want, I want to make sure the quality of the experience we are offering is the highest quality in the state of Colorado, if not the entire country. And I can't do that with over with, with too many guides. So, you know, just if you feel that you have the ability to take people out and get them into fish all day long, then reach out to whatever outfitting service you would like to work for and inquire what the process about becoming a guide is. Um, you know, we do have a couple of openings for, for both Denver and Frisco for the 2019 or sorry, 2020 season. So if it is something that you're, you know, you're interested in working for Trouts, give us a call and get you in touch with Zeke, who's our outfitting manager, and we'll start going through the process. Um, but for us, we take it very methodically um, just to make sure that when we put you with one of our clients, we know that the experience they're going to have is, is top notch. All right, we have some more questions. Uh, Richard asks, is the new Sage LL the same blank and specs as the old LL VPS uh, or VPS Lite? So, no. Um, it's similar. It's, it's going to be the technology is very different. So the LL back in that day was just, I don't even know what the technology they called it was. But we've, since we've had Generation 5 technology, We've had Kinet, which was the old Sage XP. Um, and then, then we had Kinetic Technology, which was the Sage 1. And now we've got Kinetic HD Technology, which is the Sage X, as well as the Sage LL. So, you know, the neat thing about Sage is every time they come out with a new rod, it's not just a new taper. It's a new technology. And the technology from Generation 5 was just straight, you know, in the traditional graphite fly rod, you're going to have this, the, the graphite fibers of the rod are going to be going just straight up and down across the rod, right? So it's just, you know, there's, you know, uh, just linearly uh, uh, through the length of the rod is how the graphite fibers go. When they went to kinetic technology in the stage one, what they did is they took those graphite fibers and they twisted it. So just imagine like you're kind of twisting the dish rack. So all of a sudden now, instead of those fibers going straight, they're spiral. What that did is it, is it minimized the lateral movement, the side-to-side -side movement of the fly rod during the casting stroke, which then enabled or led to a much more accurate, precise presentation of the fly. What they did with Kinetic HD when they came out with the Sage X is they used a new graphite material and a new resin. The resin is what holds all the graphite together. So they used an, a, a graphite resin material they got from Boeing. Again, that relationship would make Sage so unique. And that which, which ultimately created a tighter weave and a much denser uh, graphite fiber, which is going to lead to a lot more feel in the fly rod and a lot quicker recovery during the casting stroke, which makes it more responsive and even more accurate than what Kinetic HD or the Kinetic material. So the Trail L using Kinetic HD technology is going to be a very different fly rod than the predecessor LL from way back in the day. The taper is going to be similar um, Jerry Steam, who's the, the head rod designer at Sage, you know, I think he wanted to kind of use that classic, you know, sought after taper of the LL, but bring it technologically into the 21st century with the Kinetic HD technology. Uh, Robert Hernandez is asking, do you recommend <clears throat> always breaking down your rods after you're done using it for the day, or can you leave it together for a period of time? And if you can leave it together for a period of time, uh, how long would you leave it together before you break it down? 
I mean, you know, you've got companies like Loomis that make, you know, one piece, nine foot, five weight fly rods. Orvis did for a little bit. So if you're someone that, you know, I know I've got a fly rod that is always put together in my boat. I just, I don't take it apart because I've got a really good rod storage system. I will say that by leaving it in my boat all the time and going on dirt roads and highways, the rod is inevitably like from a, from a cosmetic standpoint, it gets beat up. Um, you know, obviously we've got Titan rod bolts with, you know, Yakima's got the new rod rack. Those are all great options. Um, they are going to be a little bit tough on your rod, but they're great ways to keep the rod intact. And if you're using one of those, I don't really see a reason you ever really need to take your rod apart. One good thing you may always want to invest in if you're, if you're using those is like scientific angler has these rod sleeves. So basically it's just kind of like one of those old like Chinese finger traps where you can put your rod into this. What, it, what this does is going to keep your, your, you know, the flies, leader, tippet, weight, indicator, all of that is kind of contained so it's not going to be this giant bird's nest when you pull it out. Um, if you don't have one of those rod carriers and you're talking about using one of those, um, you know, like the, the, the hood-mounted, you know, magnetic rod racks that kind of go up the top of your car or you're someone that, you know, throws it in your ski rack or under the, uh, the windshield wiper of your car or, you know, like me. Maybe you're going to put it through the, the, the back window of your pickup truck. In those instances, that's just really hard on your rod. And you are just in increasing, not the when, but, you know, if the rod is going to break, but when it's going to break. So, you know, for me, if you really want to take the best care of your fly rod, breaking it down, putting it in the rod socket, into a rod tube, or you know, these rod carrying systems that, you know, fish pond, uh, Sims and Orvis all have. I mean, this is what I used to carry my rod, just because it's one consolidated spot for my rods and my reels. So I think that if you're wanting to take the best carrier rod, breaking it down every day and point it into either the rod tube or one of the storage devices, that's going to be the best way to preserve and take care of your rod. Second, using a rod carrying system like the Yakima, like the, the uh, Denver Outfitters or the Rodsmith, you know, all the, they're all, I mean, we, we prefer the Rodsmith ones personally. You know, they, they, address a lot of the issues that the old Titan rod bolts had in terms of taking better care of your rod because it's a PVC line as well as taking care of your reel and the overall locking mechanism. Um, and then third, if you, you know, if you do want to, you know, carry it on your windshield or in the back of your truck, you know, just know that that you're, you're not taking the best care of it. It is the most, it is more convenient than having to break your rod down at the end of the day. Um, but you are just, you're increasing the, the, the likelihood of it breaking at some point just because of, you know, little micro fractures that are going to end up in the rod. All right, last question, because I have to prepare for uh, the intro to fly fishing live stream here in a couple, like in an hour. Uh, so last question is from Randy. Uh, is there a way to protect your rod ferrules, uh, a lube or paste to use prior uh, to when you put your rod together at, or break your rod down? So last question. So the St. Croix used to give you like a little like little tub. It was kind of like a wax material that you could put on the, the, the ferrule of your fly rod that would kind of keep it from, from moving a lot or you know, kind of just like secure it down. Um, you know, a lot of people like old wives tails you can use just kind of some of the, the grease from the, the corner of your nose. That's that I've seen that work. Really the best thing you can do. Let me grab the other section of this to show you. Because ultimately what we're talking about is if you're using that ferrule wax, what you're trying to do is, is minimize the likelihood that the ferrules are going to slip. So we've got our sleeve ferrule here. Rod goes together. What you don't want to have happen is through the course of the day it slips, and then you're casting it, and then there's not it's not securely in place, and you're going to have the ferrule blow up. So that's the, the, the concern in wanting to have the, make sure your ferrules are securely aligned. So the best thing you can do is when you're putting the rod together, and it's going to be hard to see, but what I'm doing with this is I'm going to, I'm going to slowly twist this, the, the, the internal part of the ferrule. I'm going to twist it and lock it into place. So instead of just putting the rod together, um, just standard, I'm going to get it together and then I'm going to twist it and, and really lock it into place. And that's going to really help secure that ferrule. Um, from there, you just have to kind of check it through the course of the day. If I'm fishing a dry fly rig, most likely my ferrules aren't going to slip a whole lot because there's not a lot of weight on the end of my line. If I'm fishing a heavy nymph rig or even more so streamers for the entire day, every, you know, 20, 30 minutes, I'm just going to take a couple minutes and just make sure that all the ferrules on the rod are good and snug. And that's about as good as you can do. So there is ferrule paste out there, Randy. Um, but in all honesty, it doesn't do anything more than just simply, you know, kind of twisting and locking that rod into place. That's going to be one of the best things you can do. 
All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. That was, was a great talk. We'll we look forward to doing it again sometime in the future.